I'm Corey Johnson, in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Russia's Google connection and Google's Russia connection. Google the latest big tech company to admit taking money from the Kremlin-sponsored hackers during last year's U.S. presidential election. We'll discuss Google's role in fake news. Plus, tech and taxes. Apple CEO Tim Cook meets with French PM Emmanuel Macron in Paris as they weigh sweeping overhauls of digital platforms across Europe. And a wide-ranging interview with former Microsoft CEO and Alley Clippers owner Steve Ballmer. His thoughts on Twitter, Trump, immigration, and his enduring legacy. But first to our lead, Russia-linked accounts used Google to influence the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Google investigators found that nearly $5,000 in ads tied to the Kremlin are also investigating another $53,000 in ad spending coming from Russia at large, first reported in The Washington Post and The New York Times. The mission is new. Google previously said it couldn't find any evidence of Russian interference, but data from Twitter proved the earlier contention was wrong. Mark Bergen, who covers Google for Bloomberg, joins us right now. Mark, what are they telling us uh, that's, that's new here? Uh, well, right now, the company's not really telling us anything, which is sort of frustrating. I mean, I think they're, they're still beginning their probe. Um, but we know that they've used Google properties. It sounds like uh, they found, as you said, uh, under $5,000 worth of ads. Uh, we're not sure if those ran on YouTube, if they ran on Gmail, Search. Um, the display network. I mean, Google, right now the problem is focused on Facebook, but Google has a much bigger sprawling network of advertising, right? They're the world's biggest digital advertiser, and there's a bunch of different channels that, that uh, Russian actors could use. Right. Now, you and I just talked about this on Bloomberg Radio a little while ago. Some people who wanted a preview of this conversation could have been listening to Bloomberg Radio in the last hour. But uh, one of the interesting things to me is they have all kinds of systems supposedly involved to make sure that, say, they're customers pay them mm -hmm. or to understand that the content gets there on time or that it gets delivered yeah. in a proper way. It looks like they didn't have any system either to vet the stuff before it went out or even afterwards. I mean, this is we've been talking about Russian interference in this election for uh, more than a year now. Google just coming with this information. Yeah, I think part of the issue is really drawing the line. I mean, you know, we saw this morning they were saying that there's still there's a pull bucket of $53,000 worth of ads. They're determining whether that can fall into this is these are trolls or deliberately spreading misinformation and lies, uh, or this is just Russian accounts um, that we're spending money in rubles or, or uh, build to Russian businesses. I mean, I think Russia Today is a perfect example. So the, the notion otherwise is, is that some of it could be legitimate ads. Right not fake news. Yeah, I think so. I think that's where, I mean, there's, there's probably behind the scenes, both in, in the boardroom and then negotiating with Congress about where the line is drawn here, right? Um, I mean, uh, it might be drawn at disclosure, right? Yeah. Google doesn't uh, advertise everywhere, whether it's in print or on the airwaves, whether the airwaves are on cable, which are less regulated than, than, than federal, yeah. the FCC uh, airwaves, yeah. uh, in, in terms of broadcast all have to say where the money comes from for a political ad. Right, and that seems to be the direction we're moving, right? Congress is certainly they're putting more pressure. Facebook and Google have been resisting this for a long time. It, it's, in, you know, political spending is it's pretty big on the platforms and it's growing. Uh, and this election was a, uh, right. a, a really good case point for that. We talked to a congressman last week who has seen what the Facebook ads were. Facebook we won't, won't share that with us yet, but they've seen it at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to listen to what he said about what these ads actually were. Check this out. Sure. When you talk generally about the issues of race, uh, the divisive points in our country, uh, the issue of immigration and, and migration, and how the American public was reacting to that, just uh, remind yourself how candidate Trump used those issues to heat up the American public, and clearly uh, the Russians exploited that at the same time. So, Mark, the idea that this was the stuff that was about, it was the racist ads, at least in Facebook, racist ads, uh, perhaps anti-Semitic ads, certainly anti-immigrant things, the very things that were stirring up uh, voters uh, in some places to vote for President Trump. Right. I think with Google's interesting, a lot of these websites that um, had a big presence on Facebook, one of the ways they're probably making money is with Google display ads, right? That's one of the biggest uh, three million sites and apps on the Internet. A lot of the fake news sites probably had banner ads that were run by Google. I, you know, but both Google and Facebook are in this weird position where they've been telling shareholders and advertisers we have an amazing tools for targeting um, at, you know, reaching your consumers, and now they're kind of, Facebook in particular, and I imagine we'll see the same from Google, they're going to step back and say, well, maybe these weren't as effective and, and certainly not, um, you know, these weren't the deciding factor in the election. Well, and this is also, the, it, it's interesting to me that it was so, the, the Russian 
uh, uh, the bad actors in Russia were so uh, on top of the latest trends in advertising. If I go into my Bloomberg terminal, I can look at the role that Google and Facebook have in a global advertising market. And what you see is number one that that number is growing. That both these, these you can see these pies, these, these bars are getting bigger. Pies, those are actually columns. The columns are getting bigger, which is to suggest more money. But also in terms of percentage of revenue, you know, this is a percentage of revenue for Google in the advertising market, much bigger than Facebook. Also, a growing percentage of revenue in the global advertising market, which really shows that uh, the Russian hackers were on top of the, the most effective ways to reach people in modern society. Russia got it, even if U.S. regulators didn't. Yeah, and I think, you know, Daily Beast had a really fascinating story about they claimed there are video bloggers on YouTube that Russia, some Russian networks had paid. I mean, that's where, you know, these are, as YouTube is just all user-generated content, um, they, they might not be even running ads. Uh, you know, this certainly isn't something that Google may be aware of. And so it, that would be an instance of what, you know, the, the call organic, right, reach. This is not necessarily paid ads, but these are um, using YouTube, the world's biggest video platform, to, sp to spread lies and propaganda. Well, and that's just what we know about the U.S. Who knows what's going on in other elections all around the world, in, in Europe, in, in Asia, in Africa. Uh, it certainly is a global store. We're just getting to start with uh, Mark. Great stuff, as always. Mark Bergen from Bloomberg News. All right, Bloomberg's Emily Chang sat down with Steve Ballmer. Los Angeles Clippers owner, of course, for a wide-ranging interview in Seattle, Ballmer's home. Ballmer confirmed he still owns a big chunk of Twitter, but he thinks the company could be doing more. They're driving forward. Uh, like anything uh, that I've been involved with, more, better, faster is always good. I uh, would love to see more, better, faster, but I think... More, better of what? More, better product, more, better earnings, more better revenue, more better improvements in cost structure, you name it. Uh, and that's not a specific criticism. It's just a general view that things need to move even faster. Full disclosure, Bloomberg LP in a partnership with Twitter to produce a global breaking news video network. We're putting that together right now. All right, later we're going to show a lot more of that interview, plus uh, his, uh, Steve Ballmer's thoughts on President Trump immigration and his legacy at Microsoft. Coming up, more of Bloomberg Technologies coverage in Seattle this week, talking to some politicians, business leaders, all about how the tech industry is transforming the Emerald City. We're going to kick that off with Matt McElwin of Madrona Venture Group next. This is Bloomberg. Well, all this week, Bloomberg Technology broadcasting from Seattle with anchor tenants like Amazon, Microsoft, and VMware. It's a hub for technology and innovation. It has been for some time, but outside of those tech giants, it's also the home to a growing number of startups, which could lead the wave in AI and cloud computing. Joining us to help kick things off right now, Matt McIlwain, of Madrona Venture Group's managing director. Matt, always a pleasure to see you. I look at you with the Bloomberg Likewise, monitors Corey. behind you. Isn't that a good thing? Hey, um, you and I have been talking about this for a long time, about sort of what makes Seattle such a tech hub. And, and I wonder, you know, we mentioned those great big companies. Surely Microsoft and the history of Microsoft in that city, even long before Amazon, has got to, you got to start there. Well, you got to start with Microsoft. Uh, they've been a, a huge driver of the software ecosystem and now the cloud ecosystem. But as you say, you know, two of the top five market cap companies in the world are the tech companies in Amazon and Microsoft. But there's just a plethora of startups and there's thousands and thousands of folks working at companies like Google and Facebook up here. So we've really got to cover it in terms of a diversity of perspectives in the tech industry. Yeah, I, I guess we, we, we leave out Facebook and other companies that have very uh, a large presence up there, Google included, that have, that have hired so many people and have such big operations there. Is, tell me, is it chicken or egg there? I mean, is it, is it trying to chase after all those great engineers who might be falling off of all those other places or have gone to Seattle for opportunities at Amazon and Microsoft and VMware but find themselves, oh, wow, Facebook's here, oh, wow, Google's here, there's, there's opportunity? Well, let me give you a good example. I mean, there's a great team that was up here for Google that invented this technology called Kubernetes, which basically manages uh, uh, containers like Docker containers. And that team was up here from Google, 
they decided to leave and build a business around that called Heptio, and we funded it along with our friends at Axel Partners. So these are the kind of things that happen, or a company like a Smartsheet, which has a deep ecosystem relying on the cloud partners both at Microsoft and Amazon and building up a business now that's well over $100 million and rapidly growing. And so that's what we like to see is that there's talent that comes and goes from these different companies and oftentimes they get inspired to start from scratch and build something new. Um, is there is any, any kind of industry area we might want to say that, that uh, Seattle is going to be known for? I would, I would venture cloud is a certain thing up there, right, with VMware so big and Amazon Web Services. Well, I think hands down, we're the cloud capital of the world. I mean, I was actually visiting with a group of executives from Huawei today, and we have Alibaba offices and offices from all kinds of companies trying to understand what's next in cloud. We believe that serverless technologies and microservices architectures is a whole bunch of things we could dig into deep there on the technological side. But I think what's overlooked sometimes is just how big areas like machine learning and artificial intelligence are up here with Paul Allen's Artificial Intelligence Institute, University of Washington's you know, School uh, of Artificial Intelligence. They're just doing great things as well. And then finally, what about all the ways we inter interface with computing? Think about Alexa with voice or mixed reality in some of the areas that, that uh, Microsoft's involved with. So we've really got the full stack here of some of the leading edge things that are going on in next generation computing. Uh, yes, I, I would be amiss a, a if I didn't mention the role of UW, which you just did, not just because they're 6-0 and and, and uh, number <laughs> 5 in the country right now, but, but yeah, much too much of the pain of my, my heart. But uh, I, it is, I, think it, it is, I think nationally maybe UW's role, University of Washington's role, is, is overlooked in the role of sort of driving uh, this. What, what is the University of Washington so good at when it comes to technology? Well, one area is this area of machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'll give you an example. They recruited an incredible professor, Carlos Gestrin, five years ago from Carnegie Mellon, and he became the Amazon professor of machine learning. We promptly started a company with he and some of his uh, team and built that company, which was called Dato and then Turi, into one of the leading players in machine learning as a service. That company was then bought by Apple, and Apple's now building a bigger and bigger presence up here in Seattle. So I think machine learning and AI, professors like Pedro Domingos, Luis Cizé, I could go on and on over there at the University of Washington. Probably one of the most interesting examples now is a company called XNOR that Professor Ali Farhadi has founded. That's all about machine learning and artificial intelligence at the edge. So the edge computing side versus the cloud computing side and some of the things that are starting to happen uh, at the Internet of Things kind of area related to deep learning. All right, so when we talk to all these, all these places that want to start uh, startups that will look like Silicon Valley, whether it's New York or Phoenix or Austin or, or Chicago or Grand Rapids or you name it, uh, another thing that Seattle's got going for, right, you've got your, your, your very strong university focus on technical skills. You've got your established uh, technology innovators that are throwing off people who've made a lot of money and want to try again. But you've also got a very active venture capital community, and you can pat yourself on the shoulder right now, but Madrona has been there from the very start for companies, uh, you know, a little company like Amazon that you guys were one of the early backers of. What's the venture scene like in Seattle, and how is it different than Silicon Valley? Well, our focus has been going all the way back to being the first investors in Amazon back in 1995. Focus on day one opportunities and day one founders. Get involved at a very early stage. I mentioned Carlos and Heptio and some other examples. And so be there at day one, but be there for the long term and be there focused on the Pacific Northwest. And we think there's a bunch of great venture capital firms in Silicon Valley and other places. We just happen to focus on early stage companies in the Northwest. Now, we also really do work well with those other firms, and it's a, there's a growing interest um, once again. There was kind of a cycle in the late 90s, and now we're back here 20 years later with very strong interest from Silicon Valley partners working in conjunction with us and others. We've got a vibrant angel community, not just some super angel investors, but also some very large family offices, Paul Allen's Vulcan or Bezos Expeditions right, right. or Gates, you know, Cascade. So, you know, you know, Trilogy with John Stanton from the wireless industry. So there's really a nice mix of folks in the, in the uh, kind of large family offices that we like to work with together as well. Uh, and you can't beat the state taxes. 
I mean, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur who thinks you're going to get rich, I, I remember uh, this guy, uh, this woman I used to work with at the Industry Standard magazine, her husband uh, was about to come into a bunch of money from a, a wireless company her father was selling. They moved to Washington to establish residence because there wasn't going to be any state sales taxes for them, but they wanted to stay involved in the technology community. It seems that that's a very big draw for the likes of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and others. Well, I think that some of those folks very intentionally either started their company or moved their company here to, to Washington and Seattle specifically for that reason. We don't have a state income tax. That's a massive competitive advantage over other states. And, it, you know, I think that's why you're seeing thousands and thousands of employees from companies like Google and Facebook that can choose to live up here to live up here. And so that advantage is very important. But here's the punchline on that. Our tax revenues are up from $28 billion to $38 billion, $10 billion in the last six years. And that's because we have this pro-investment, pro-growth, pro-opportunity community up here in Seattle. And the, the other punchline there is we have the lowest unemployment rate in the history of the city of Seattle and the state of Washington. So I think we have a pretty good tax system. No tax system is perfect, but ours is growing and our economy is growing. And I think that's going to really serve the entire community well for the long term. Couldn't agree more. I don't want to throw cold water, and I mentioned the weather in February because that's when the cold water gets thrown, but I think it's worth it up in Seattle. Matt McKillen, always a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Madrona Venture Managing Director. And he'll be joining us Thanks again so much, uh, later in the show, so stick around. All right, Elon Musk, SpaceX has launched its 14th rocket of the year, bringing the company closer to its target of 20 to 24 missions to 2017. The Falcon 9 rocket carrying 10 satellites for Iridium communications. SpaceX scheduled to launch another rocket from Florida next Wednesday. That rocket will deliver a satellite for SES and EchoStar. Coming up, Apple CEO Tim Cook in the City of Light, how he plans to combat EU tax reform efforts targeting big tech companies. This is Bloomberg. All right, Apple CEO Tim Cook met with French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris Monday. The meetup comes amid calls by France and other European nations for an aggressive overhaul of how tax companies, uh, how tech companies are paying tax across the EU. Joining us right now, Bloomberg Technology reporter Alex Webb has agreed to talk in a funny accent for us today. Thank you. Tu veux que je parle français comme ça, ça serait beaucoup plus facile pour tout le monde. That's <laughs> good. Sorry. No, that's, I'm all for the French. Uh, so uh, this is an interesting drive right here because uh, Apple is center in this, right. particularly because of the deal they got in Ireland. In, in, in Ireland. Yes, and they're facing increasing heat. Oh, well, we should be careful about calling it a deal. Apple very much says they didn't get a deal in Ireland. But um, yes, the Apple's facing increasing heat in Ireland as well to pay this tax bill, which hasn't yet been delivered to Ireland as far as we understand it. It's in escrow perhaps somewhere. And um, well, Isn't it escrow or not? because they got criticism uh, following the, the demand by the EU to pay it, saying that they hadn't actually put it aside. Yes, well, I, mean, I think they may put it inside in their account somewhere, but Ireland hasn't received it. And Ireland was talking about putting it in escrow for itself before, right. while it appealed it. That hasn't yet happened. We knew that early last month, four European finance ministers, um, France, Germany, uh, Italy, and Spain, they sent a letter to the European Commission proposing a system whereby big tech companies, and I suppose then companies more broadly, are taxed based on revenue and not by profit. I think the argument then being that it's harder to uh, push the profit into the low tax nations, perhaps like Luxembourg or Ireland indeed, and therefore um, they wouldn't be allegedly evading tax, so to speak. And, and, and to that, um, is, is Apple the canary in the coal mine here? Are they the company that will, will ultimately make the deal that all the rest of the companies are going to have to follow? Or they're really going to be one-offs that there'll be very different treatments for these companies? I, I think it's the companies are not going to make deals with the nation states or indeed with the, uh, the European regulatory authorities. What's going to happen is there will be a change in the law at that level. Now, we know the European Commission Oh, sorry, the European Parliament can be very slow moving when that stuff happens. Um, the fact is that Apple is not the only company doing this. There is, of course, issues. There are, of course, issues with Amazon and others, and indeed companies outside tech. 
And, and what is the fundamental issue about you know, how has Apple been able to skirt these taxes and or follow the law as they see it, but not have to pay the same amount of taxes as, as companies based in the continent? So uh, Apple, what has happened historically in the whole um, issue of contention, bone of contention last year, was that they were paying essentially a license fee for intellectual property, which was held um, in, in different geographies. And that was why they said, well, we're not actually generating any profit in this country. The profit is being generated by another unit elsewhere. That deal actually ended several years ago. So Apple is now, for this year and last year, for example, paying the higher tax rate. The issue then comes that um, the tax rate in places like Ireland, just organically, is a lot lower than it is in the US. So they pay 12.5% tax in Ireland. Now, the moment they bring back any money from Ireland, for instance, they have to pay that difference with the US. So I think it's, what, 35% in the right. US. And that 22.5% delta then goes into US Treasury coffers, which is why the deal in the White House right now is so significant. And, and also interesting to see what when they decide where a piece of software is created and where the intellectual property resides and all that. It gets very complicated. Uh, that's why we're glad to have you explain it to us. Our own spy who came in from the cold. I did watch that, the Richard Burton version this weekend on your recommendation. It was fantastic. John Akari is like my hero. Oh, I love him too. I love it. <laughs> Next to you, Alex Webb from Bloomberg News. Thank you very much. All right, coming up, Steve Ballmer speaks out our interview with a former CEO of Microsoft. Just a few minutes here, his take on tax reform, immigration, and the idea of fake news. Next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Check me out on the radio. You can listen every day at Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com. And in the U.S. and Sirius XM Station 119, this is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. British Prime Minister Theresa May says the framework of her Brexit plan has not changed since her speech last month in Florence. May addressed Britain's House of Commons today as a fifth round of negotiations with the EU are set to get underway. As I set out in my speech in Florence, we want to take a creative and pragmatic approach to securing a new, deep and special partnership with the European Union, which spans both a new economic relationship and a new security relationship. European diplomats are ramping up efforts to ensure President Trump's decision to decertify Iran's compliance doesn't risk scuttling the international nuclear accord. Allies are said to be seeking out members of Congress and trying to influence administration advisors. Tokyo's governor, Yuriko Koiki, says that her doubts about the Trump administration, Koiki's party of hope, is challenging Shinzo Abe's ruling party in the general election scheduled for October 22nd. I am not yet sure whether the Trump administration is stable. There are extremely dynamic personnel changes in the main White House posts. Alongside the American people, I want to look carefully to see what kind of administration this will be. Japan's election is less than two weeks away, and Koiki must decide today if she will run. More than a dozen wildfires whipped by powerful winds swept through California wine country, destroying at least 1,500 homes and businesses and forcing an estimated 20,000 people to leave the area. At least one death has been reported. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 8.30 Thursday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Uh, let's start off in New Zealand where trading's been underway for about 30 minutes Tuesday morning and uh, the NZX currently off a tenth of 1%. Uh, this is after we saw U.S. stocks uh, drift lower on pretty low volumes really uh, due to the Columbus Day holiday. Treasury markets were closed there. Uh, we saw gold up a little. West Texas slightly higher but still under $50 at $49.53 a barrel. Here in Australia, ASX futures are down a quarter of 1%. The Aussie dollar little changed at 77.5 cents. We're waiting on business Business confidence numbers here for September after a horror retail read a week ago. Nikkei futures, meanwhile, pretty flat at the moment, waiting on current accounts numbers for August out of Japan, estimated to come in at $19.7 billion surplus. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Corey Johnson in for Emily Chang. We'll now look back at our top story. Tech companies like Facebook, Google, and Twitter are finding Russian-linked accounts that interfered with the 2016 presidential elections. And that worries Twitter shareholder and former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. He says companies can't do more at the present moment to police the spread of fake news. Bloomberg's Emily Chang sat down with the LA Clippers owner in Seattle. We launched our platform of data from the government about the government. No fake news, no alternate facts. We launched on tax day. We keep adding more data and we keep the information current. But the real thing we're doing now at usafacts.org, in case somebody wants to check, Got that is in we're, there. we're trying to help citizens really run through topics of the day. So we have a walkthrough up there right now that will walk you through the president's budget in the context of what has happened historically. What has GDP looked like? What has tax revenue looked like? What's the deficit looked like? And how does all of that compare to the CBO? We make no predictions. But we're going to make sure people can walk through and look at these government proposals in the context of the past. That's all that's factual. And then be able to say, does this make sense to me or not? Uh, we have a little video that goes along with it that will explain to citizens this is kind of the set of data and the way to think about by the numbers, how do you think about something like the budget proposal? You say it's just the facts, and I know you now know these facts more, better than almost anyone. As our lawmakers, as the president, as they talk about tax reform and health care, do you have any advice? Yeah, in a way I do. These things are holistic issues. It's sort of funny to me. We look at tax reform, we look at the budget, and we look at health care. And yet when you really look at the economics of these three things, they're linked just like this. I mean, what does it mean to have a budget without tax reform? It's our process. I'm not condemning anybody, but it's kind of nutty. You have to have a tax plan in order to have a budget. Be like a company having an expense plan without a revenue plan. It just doesn't make sense. And then one of the biggest pieces of expenses, that's health care. And you don't have a health care. I mean, how, how do these things, so really understanding how these things mesh together would be a key piece of advice I would certainly give decision makers, legislators, and executive branch. You mentioned this is an age of misinformation, of fake news. How big a problem is that? And what's the responsibility of these platforms, Facebook, Google, Twitter? I, I think this, this notion of people being able to sort of be fed whatever's going to make them feel good, because that's what people are really doing. People want to feed whatever the instincts are. And I think that the goal has to be to say, this is how it looks. You can see it any way you want to, but someplace you have to come and be able to take a look at stuff objectively. I'm not sure you could say that's Facebook's job. They're not in the news business. They pass along other people's news. Same thing with Google. That's, that's part of the issue here is things can look authentic. We did a USA Facts poll, and when surveyed, people will say, I find my information most often on social media, and I trust it the least. So do you think Facebook and Google and Twitter should be policing this more, or that's not their job? They can't. It's not in the nature of what's going on. I do think over time there needs to be something that's the equivalent of an uh, authenticated user on Twitter where you get the little bullet that says you really are who you say you are. I think it would be nice to have authenticated sources you know, so that people can say, I really want to see not just what the crowd is saying, but I want to hear from some authentic uh, sources. What if that information isn't coming from the crowd, if it's coming from our own president? Is it a problem if, if he's the one spreading misinformation? Well, we elected the president, our country as a whole. He is our, is our uh, you know, sort of uh, president in chief. Uh, and I know there's people who have problems with that and people who are supportive of that. But at least when the president speaks, he's speaking authentically for himself. And in a sense, that is a set of facts. When a major policy leader speaks, uh, you could say it's true, it's not. You like what he says, you don't like what he says, but it's what he's thinking. And every voter probably benefits by having the ability to hear directly, just as we hear directly from other people. Uh, I get a chance to speak directly on the Internet. LeBron James gets a chance to speak directly on the Internet. Not everybody wants to hear what people see, say to one another. Uh, they don't always agree. Uh, certainly we've seen that with LeBron and, uh, and the president. There are some who say the president is taking it to another level, perhaps even inciting nuclear war on Twitter. Should he be kicked off Twitter? Should he be allowed to make these statements on Twitter? 
Uh, everybody sh has the right to speak for themselves. Uh, and that includes the President of the United States. Everybody has the right to speak for themselves. That's kind of uh, in the fundamental nature of this country, and I think it's an important one. Uh, I think the citizens have an obligation to elect the people who they think will best represent their interests. And that gets a chance to get battle tested every two years, every four years. And I love our system because people have to constantly prove themselves. And if people are doing things uh, that are not valued, that'll come across. And if people are doing things that are valued. Now, the way our system works, it doesn't take 100% to win. It takes logically 51%, of course, with the Electoral College. That's not really what it is. But it takes logically 51% to, to win. Uh, and people have a right to hear directly uh, in there as they go cast their ballots. You ran Microsoft for many years. You dealt with issues like immigration. Do you have any concerns about the stands the president is taking on things like DACA, for example? I think immigration is a super important thing. My dad was an immigrant. My grandparents on the other side were immigrants. I value the fact that immigrants come into this country. I think it is hugely, hugely important. It's not something that was just important 100 years ago. It remains important. It remains important in terms of high-tech workers coming into the country. It remains important in terms of people moving back and forth across our, our southern border. And there are complicated issues. There are issues of national security, but there are also uh, issues of economy and fundamental humanity. And I do think it's important to look at all of those things, uh, including humanity, as we kind of address the plight of uh, the, the so-called DACA. Great stuff. That was some of our conversation with former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. And coming up, more Ballmer. His thoughts on the mixed legacy of Microsoft that he's left behind and the future of artificial intelligence. This is Bloomberg. Back to LA Clippers owner Steve Ballmer. Emily Chang sat down with Ballmer, former Microsoft CEO, of course, to ask to, uh, what he thinks about the current CEO, Satya Nadella. What is it like to watch him take over? I think his book was actually pretty good about that. He recognizes the good. He recognizes the things that needed to be changed. Uh, I think I think he's navigated that uh, very very well. And from my perspective, you know, we knew we needed to get into the cloud. I got that started. He's really taken it to another level, and I respect the fact that he's had to do things differently. I knew things would have to be do, done differently in that area. That's part of the, the reason it was a good time for a change, if you will. Hardware's a whole different deal. He's pushed that along with Xbox and Surface, and you know, I kind of respect that needed things done differently. And, and over time, things need to be shaken up and freshened. And, you know, like I had been at Microsoft the whole time. It reflected my, my personality and Bill's personality. But kind of like children, things need to keep growing, if you will. And we, we uh, revel when our children are, are grown up and are, uh, you know, sort of making their own way. And I revel that Satya is taking Microsoft uh, to its next level, sort of going forth in, in new and in different ways. So Azure is still moving along, but Amazon Web Services still much bigger and growing faster. I mean, do you want more, better, faster from Satya in the cloud? Sure, I do, absolutely. <laughs> 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 and as, a, as an investor on our quarterly call, <laughs> I say, come on, let's keep it moving, let's keep it moving, let's keep it moving. Are you listening into all the calls? No, I don't listen. And I, you know, like any other large investor, I do a quarterly call with yeah. uh, Amy Hood, who's the CFO. And I think Microsoft's really done a pretty phenomenal job, particularly on the office side, but also on the Azure side. And, but is there a lot of room for improvement? Because the market leader on the Azure side is, is pretty damn big. Yeah, I do think there is. And what kind I of improvement? Microsoft, you need to have even better attachment and ability to sell to startups and other development companies. The de 
<laughs> developers, developers, developers. And with Azure, you have to win the developers. And I think Microsoft's getting there, but still has a lot more to do. You said you're done being an, an investor. Is that still the case? Yeah, I'm not making, quote, new investments, unquote. So just mutual funds and Microsoft and Twitter, that's it? Index funds, index funds. Keep it simple, have everything pegged to the market. I have some bonds, I have Microsoft, I have Twitter, and then I have a couple of small private things that, that I don't do much of, but I have a basketball-based investment. Uh, I have one investment with a, uh, a couple investment with friends. That's it. There's this big debate about the future of AI and whether it's dangerous or not. Elon Musk thinks robots could take over the world. They could supersede the human race. Mark Zuckerberg has said that's irresponsible to talk like that. What do you think? <laughs> oh, I think that's the usual. What shall I say? Um, hyper, you know, sort of. Uh, effervescence of the tech community. Oh, let's say something extreme. Oh, let's tune it down. Oh, oh. I mean, when you get right down to it, is AI very important? Yes. Will it improve the way people live? Yes. Do we know all of what we will accomplish today? No. Uh, but getting computers to be smarter at helping people do what they want to do every day, that part can't get bad. I'm sure there's a place in time where we can speculate about all of the tough societal issues, but we're years away from that. So Elon Musk, of course what he says in the long run could be right, but the long run could be a long, long run. Not gonna happen in the next 10 years or so. And of course Zuckerberg's ready to, and prepared and you know, sort of right to talk about that. But right now, you can put some of that clutter out of your mind. This artificial intelligence stuff will make a big difference. So you think it's possible that the human race could become extinct and, and no, robots No, the human take race isn't going to become <laughs> extinct. But how powerful will be computers' ability to reason? And what will that fully mean? We don't know. But we're not going to deal with that problem for 20 years. Well, that was Bloomberg's Emily Chang with Clippers owner and ex-Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. Back with you now, Matt McIlwin, uh, Madrona Venture Managing Partner, Managing Director, I should say. Uh, Matt, uh, talk to me about Steve and his role there in Seattle. Obviously, the, the, he's, he's got an L.A. team even while he still lives up in Seattle. Yeah, no, Steve still has a significant presence up here. And, you know, I think people overlook what a great job he did on growing the top line and the profitability of Microsoft and making the early bets in areas like cloud and hardware. Uh, sure, there were some areas, some acquisitions that were tough. There were some other challenges, but in the aggregate, you think you know, Steve? Oh yeah, there were some. I mean, come on, Nokia. Uh, I mean, can we yeah. remember Nokia? Can we can we talk about some of the things? I mean, Steve. I think Steve's great, and I think he's a great owner of the Clippers too. But uh, there were some, you know, multi-billion-dollar uh, things under his leadership that went way off board. Not to mention, though, all the problems with antitrust around Microsoft Windows. Well, I think, I think advertising and mobile were areas that were real struggles in that era. Uh, but I, I think in, if you look at things like where, uh, you know, he laid the groundwork and Satya, of course, leading the cloud business before he became CEO, they've really headed in the right direction on the cloud side. And they've got some massive advantages there. Not only do they have, you know, real established apps in Office 365 and other things, but they've also got all the on-premise presence that allows you to connect this increasingly hybrid world of cloud and on-premise. So I think they've got a really good strategic position. I think Satya, to his credit, doubled on, on the things that were working and leveraged some of their strengths. But, you know, Steve did a good job setting the table in a bunch of different areas. Uh, final question here. You know, what's, what is the lasting impact? I mentioned the antitrust uh, issues around Explore and Microsoft Windows. But I wonder in Seattle what the lasting impact is, particularly around companies well, at Microsoft and Amazon when they start to think about those issues about antitrust. Well, I think those are interesting topics around antitrust. It's, it's being raised in a bunch of different ways these days. I think that uh, all of the big companies, whether it's the Facebook and Google's down your way or the Microsoft's and Amazon's here, need to be cognizant that as platform companies, they have got to be good at creating a genuine platform that other people can succeed on and also being successful for themselves. You know, I think that, you know, if you look at all of that group, I'd probably highlight Google. Let's just take a recent example with Google cutting yeah. off, you know, Amazon Echo shows from YouTube. 
I mean, what's up with that? You know, I can't get access over Wi-Fi to YouTube for, because I don't like the device it's being accessed from. So there's lots of questions you can ask on that area. I don't think the companies up here in Seattle are actually in as uh, difficult a position as some of the companies down, down in the valley. Maybe because they remember the days of your Matt McGowan, I know you remember a lot. We're grateful to have you all the time from the Drone Adventure Group Managing Director. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. All right, well, coming up, investors can't get enough of the Apple iPhone suppliers giving rise to an interesting new ETF. We'll explain next. This is Bloomberg. With the release of the iPhone 8 and the upcoming iPhone 10, interest in iPhone suppliers only growing. That's given rise to a new Apple supplier ETF. Bloomberg's North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel is in Hong Kong right now and is kind enough to join me. Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, this is fascinating because this has been an investment theme for the longest time. What's going yes. into the new device and certainly what's going into the next iPhone? Yeah, you actually see this all the time in Taiwan with the lead up of the Apple uh, product releases in the autumn, uh, the gyrations, the ups and the downs. And there's lots of rumors, of course, about what Apple is going to release and whether it's going to be popular. And we've seen already a lot of these suppliers a dip in September, some upwards of 25, 30 percent because early iPhone 8 sales or orders were not as robust as expected. But now it's going back up on anticipation for the X or the 10 uh, coming out November 3rd. So there are lots of gyrations. And if you look at this particular iShares MSCI Taiwan capped ETF, it really exemplifies the sweet spot that Taiwan has in the supply chain for Apple and all the suppliers. Because 49% of the 91 companies in this ETF are tied to Apple. 41% of the companies say Apple is their top customer. 18% of all the companies, the 91 companies, uh, say uh, Apple is their top revenue source. So you can see that sweet spot. But on the other hand, you can also uh, see why the likes of President Tsai Ing-wen are trying to diversify the Taiwan economy uh, into biotech, into other areas. Uh, because, you know, Honhai and uh, companies like TSMC, they make up a quarter of the TIEX. And uh, they want to diversify uh, and because sure. to avoid those pitfalls. It also seems like it allows investors to, at least in theory, should allow the investors to lower transaction costs for acquiring that portfolio yep. in terms of how many trades they've got to put on. But secondly, just figure out what the heck's in the iPhone and know which companies to own. Yeah, that's right. I mean, one of the biggest uh, hallmarks of becoming a supplier of Apple is secrecy, right? So uh, you have to keep your secrets uh, pretty closed and those doors closed at those suppliers like Pegatron, like Largon, like Hone High Precision. A lot of these companies, uh, you look at, you go down the list, Quanta Computer, Compal, Wistron, Advanced Semiconductor, Pegatron, so many of these companies. Uh, and again, Citigroup is saying, you know, because of those uh, gyrations that we had uh, in September now coming back up time to buy companies like Largon, Honhai. They make everything from the screens, the optoelectronic components uh, to of course becoming the uh, assembler of the iPhones. Yeah and, and, and also of course the challenge are to see you never really know where the profits are. Some of these companies can supply a lot of stuff with almost no profit. Others might be taking away millions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, we have to kind of dig into each individual stock. Catcher Technology is one in particular that I've been looking at. They make the casings for the smartphones. Uh, it took a tumble again like a lot of the other ones. But the, a lot of these companies, at least the, the numbers, are looking pretty cheap, in fact. Estimated forward P.E. of Catcher, 11 times earnings right now. Sales in September, record high, 48% up. Third quarter looking like a record as well. Um, well, that's your bet, not mine. But I'll let you go there, Stephen Engel. <laughs> Stephen Engel of Bloomberg uh, in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure to tune in tomorrow for our coverage of the GeekWire Summit in Seattle. We'll talk to Starbucks CEO Kevin Johnson. It's 1 o'clock back east, 10 a.m. on the West Coast, right here on Bloomberg Television. This is Bloomberg.